And uh, welcome to a number of people who are still uh, joining us. It's lovely to have you with us. I'm Steve Osseimenser, and I help to uh, lead the uh, work forum here at the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. And uh, I'm joined by two of uh, my colleagues, uh, by Tim and Beth Yearsley, who are based in Nottingham, but are with us uh, this evening. And I want to give a bit of a shout out too to uh, my colleague, uh, Andrew Hutchinson, who you may not be able to see. Uh, he's the LICC ops person who's making sure that all our tech works this evening. Very grateful uh, to him. Well, listen, we've got an action packed uh, evening for you this evening, uh, which you'll be pleased to know is good and interactive. For those of us who are beginning to become Zoom warriors and possibly weary Zoom warriors, uh, you'll be pleased to know that we're using the full panoply of both Zoom and uh, menti.com, which I'll mention in just a, a minute. Um, but uh, please feel free to be as interactive as you feel you want to be. Um, uh, we will have the chat active, but we'll also have uh, menti.com active as well. But just before I, I begin, our vision uh, here at the LICC, as many of you know, is uh, basically that we want people to be able to make a difference uh, where, right where they are. And tonight is very much about that. We've got this, uh, I think, exciting topic, which is why you're all here, of difficult conversations. And I think a number of us have been having uh, difficult conversations or attempting to do so with the added pressure of uh, how to do that uh, in a Zoom environment. So making a difference where we are uh, is absolutely what we're about. Now, this is part of uh, a wider series that uh, uh, Tim is leading on introducing the whole Emerging Leaders course. And we'll talk a bit about that uh, towards the end, uh, but we're just delighted to have uh, you with us. Well, listen, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Tim and Beth, over to you. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here tonight. Great to see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. You are all very welcome. And I hope we're gonna have a good time together. To begin with, I just want to pose a question to you, which some of you have already answered, I can see. And that question is, how do you feel about difficult conversations? If you head over to menti.com and use that code, uh, you can see it in the chat. It's also on the handout. Love to get a sense of uh, where you guys are at coming into this conversation. And while you do that, let me just say that um, we really wanna make sure that tonight is grounded in your guys' real experience before we dive into the meat of the how-to and how this might work. So please, uh, as Steve has already said, be honest, be vulnerable, speak in the first person in the eye, and that should help us have a good time. So let's get a quick pulse check on uh, the room, so to speak. How do you feel about difficult conversations? Well, it's reasonably evenly split. Nine people say they like to confront things head on. Eight people so far say that they think harmony matters more than truth, or oh, 10 now, a few more coming in. And then uh, equally 10 people saying they avoid difficult conversations like they avoid coronavirus. I don't know which category, uh, Beth, you would put yourself in, any thoughts? A hundred percent confronting issues head on. You're 100%. definitely a confronter, <laughs> and I do know that firsthand. There we go. Guys, uh, keep, keep those uh, responses coming in and we'll be referring back to Mentimeter as we go. This evening so uh, it'll be a really useful tool to capture some of our best learning together. Over to you Beth. Thank you so much and good evening everyone it's so good to, to see you all. Um, let me introduce myself a little bit so I'm Beth I am the people and organizational development manager at the University of Nottingham Students Union which basically means when I'm not spending time with you all that I have responsibility for our human resources function, our learning and development function, the governance and the health and safety for our 34,000 student members. And difficult conversations can be a daily occurrence when you're in leadership, I'm sure this isn't new news to you all. And there are many different types of difficult conversations that we can be having at work. Things like performance management um, conversations, maybe some well-being concerns, even conversations around personal hygiene, disciplinaries, absence or ill health. There are many different types of difficult conversations that we can be having, let alone trying to have difficult conversations with people over Zoom, which makes it even harder because there's a screen which is a barrier to the subtle physical interaction that we're normally used to. But difficult conversations are something that we need to get right, especially if we want to bring our faith to our work in a purposeful way. And according to the DDI Frontline Leader Project, the number one weakness that over 20,000 frontline leaders said 
is their ability to have difficult conversations with those that report to them. And from my own experience, failed conversations can lead to disruption, they can lead to a lack of employee engagement, and even in more serious cases, they can lead to team conflict or even trigger formal grievance procedures. So this evening, we're going to be spending a bit of time together looking at that. And one of the things that we're going to do is use a case study to ground this session and this evening in reality, and hopefully to give you a practical exercise to work through. So I'm going to introduce it now um, and then I would love for you just to have in the back of your minds as we go through this evening, be thinking about it and when we come to it later on. So it's anonymized, um, but it's actually from a real situation that I found myself in a few weeks ago. OK, let me set the scene for you. So I want you to imagine that you are the HR manager in your organisation. Kyle. Um, who is an assistant manager of one of the teams in your organisation, has submitted a formal grievance against Karen, who is the manager of his team. Because Karen has spoken to him in a way that he perceived as bullying and threatening. I knew that I needed to do something, but I was also aware that this was a very precarious situation and that it was going to be a difficult conversation. And there were a few different reasons for this. First of all, I couldn't ignore it. <laughs> as much as I just wanted to move the email from my inbox to the archive folder and pretend that I hadn't received it, I knew that this was as much an email of frustration as much it was also a possibly a call for help. The situation is complicated, secondly, and it was certainly a complex issue with different people bringing their own agendas to the table. Thirdly, there were some strong feelings, and it's obvious from the, from the email that Kyle is experiencing a raft of strong emotions. And it might well be possible that Karen is also feeling similarly. This raised the stakes. And lastly, going into this conversation, I knew that there was a possibility that I might actually make the situation worse. It might be that by getting involved, I could make the whole situation even worse, and then a formal grievance might be submitted against me. An interesting situation that we're going to come back to later this evening. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Tim. So we offer you guys that as a bit of an example of the kind of workplace conversation that uh, Beth has had to face recently. But we'd love to flip it over to you guys to share something of your own contexts together. So we'll send you out into breakout rooms shortly and we'd love you to discuss these two questions. Firstly, what kinds of difficult conversations are you facing at work, either right now or coming up? And what ingredients make them difficult? So uh, we know what breakout rooms are like in these things. Everything's uh, a bit sort of stunted and a bit awkward. It's not quite as easy as when we're physically together. So our suggestion to you would be that you quickly introduce yourselves in alphabetical order. Just say who you are and where you are. Um, and then if the first person to introduce themselves also just takes on the role of group facilitator just moving things on and asking questions that would be fantastic and if the second person wouldn't mind feeding back responses to Mentimeter that would also be great and then we can pick up on the best of what your group discussions have been in a moment when we come back. So here are your two questions what kinds of difficult conversations are you facing and what ingredients make them difficult over to breakout rooms for 10 minutes um, have a good time. I hope those were good discussions uh, thank you for those of you who have sent in some thoughts onto the mentimeter beth and i've just been taking a quick look at them and wow you guys are facing some very difficult conversations this stuff is real it's complicated and uh, our hearts go out to you. Um, obviously, as much as we want to, we can't speak into every particular situation tonight. So we, we are gonna give our best go at offering you a framework that might help you approach some of these conversations. Um, but also feel free to follow up with Beth and I after this, if you have further questions. Um, I have to say, Beth is dealing with lots of these things uh, on a daily basis. So she's the real expert here. Uh, Beth, are there any in the uh, Mentimeter inputs that have uh, particularly stood out to you? I'll just put it up on the screen now for everyone to take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. And just to echo everything that Tim just said, um, I really am resonating so much um, with everything that people are saying, whether it's the time of year that pay reviews are coming up or people are having to have redundancy conversations 
or difficult conversations with new starters? You know, how do you induct somebody into your organization when you're sat on a tiny screen <laughs> to them? Um, all of these difficult conversations that are, that are coming up and resonated with one person who had put in that um, they've recently gone from a peer to a line manager and, and how do you deal with that? Um, let alone the constantly changing situation. And um, I know a lot of people have put in about furlough and particularly around having to um, change, you know, are we going into the job retention or is it the job support scheme? Oh no, we're going back into lockdown. So that means we're going back to the furlough scheme and it's finishing in December. No, it's not, it's finishing in March. You know, there's just consistently <laughs> different um, situations, aren't there? And, and I'm really pleased and um, that this is such a prescient moment for everybody. I'm hoping that we'll be able to speak into some of these later. Yeah, uh, also one just scrolled off the screen there, which was uh, people expect Christians to be nice. Um, I think that's true. And that in some ways is an added complication in this. There are um, perceptions people might have of us if they know we're Christians at work, that we need to operate in a certain way or that maybe we're, we're afraid of difficult conversations. Um, I just think that's worth acknowledging um, and actually, what I hope to show you guys tonight is that our faith can be a, a, a brilliant resource to us that helps us have better difficult conversations. It might not make them any less difficult, but it might make them better. So let's tackle this to begin with. What difference does the gospel make to our difficult conversations? That's where we're going to begin. So if you have a Bible nearby, you might want to grab it as we'll be going into that in a second. We'll talk about how my uh, how a gospel approach to difficult conversations might change what we do. And then lastly, uh, we'll give you guys a chance to press into that, make it a bit more real and apply some of what we're going to talk about in this next section to the case study that Beth brought to us earlier. So your handouts will be a useful resource to you in, uh, uh, in what's to come this evening. So you can uh, grab those from the Zoom chat as well. But let's begin with this question. What difference does the gospel make to our difficult conversations? Well, as I mused on this, I found myself drawn to Matthew 18. So if you have a Bible to hand and you want to flick to Matthew 18, that will be uh, where we're going to spend the next few minutes. But let me just remind us, if you didn't already know that, we show up as ambassadors for God's kingdom in our workplaces. And I don't think that means that we seek conflict, but when conflict in, and difficult conversations come, it does mean we approach those kinds of conversations with a different posture. And um, on first glance, you might think difficult conversations are a kind of necessary evil. We want to get from A to B, to deliver the review, offer the feedback, deal with the grievance, make the apology. And the conversation is just a way to get us there by solving that problem, by getting us from A to B. We just have to get it done. But this is quite a task oriented mindset. There's a problem that needs to be solved here. Um, and it's quite a one dimensional approach to difficult conversations. When we remember that we are kingdom ambassadors in our workplace, I think it adds a different dimension to our difficult conversations. And that's what Matthew 18 is going to show us. So let's see how Jesus frames a difficult conversation uh, in a passage that's normally titled Dealing with Sin in the Church. So here's uh, Matthew 18, 15 to 17. I'll just read that out quickly. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. First thing to say about this passage is, yes, I know it's a passage about sin in the church. This is not a copy and paste approach to having difficult conversations in the workplace. That's not what I'm using this passage for. But there is a fundamental principle here that's worth paying attention to that becomes more clear when we look at the context this passage is sandwiched in. It actually comes in the middle of two parables that help us see a deeper principle. So immediately before this extract, Jesus tells a parable about a man who leaves his 99 sheep to go and seek out the one who has gone astray. And if he finds it, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. And after the dealing with sin in the church passage, 
Jesus will tell a parable about forgiveness. A master at great cost to himself cancels the debt of his servant who cannot pay him back. Both of these parables reveal God's heart as fundamentally oriented towards the person. So from an economic point of view, forget the one sheep, look after your 99. Don't abandon your 99 on a hillside where they're vulnerable. And from an economic point of view, call in the debt. That's your money. Don't just write it off. But the kingdom doesn't seem to operate on this metric. And when we see Jesus explaining how to deal with a brother or sister that sins, we don't see the person or their sin as a problem to be dealt with that we need to get from A to B. We see them as a person that God is seeking relationship with. And I'm sure you can hear the overtones of the whole gospel, even in this short passage. So I said a moment ago that thinking about diff difficult conversations for Difficult conversations for some of us is a necessary evil. Um, it's just a tool to solve a problem. It can seem one dimensional, though, if that's our only approach. But what I'm trying to show you here from Matthew 18 is that the gospel gives us another dimension. It gives us a reason to think about the person as well as the problem. And this matters because as we turn to look at the how to, of how to have difficult conversations. It keeps us from using manipulative techniques on the person. And rather, we do our best to employ strategies that make the conversation beneficial for the person. Difficult conversations can happen for the benefit of the person. And therefore, even our most difficult conversations at work can be a way to bear witness to Jesus and his kingdom and the values therein. Not by the words we speak only, but also by the way we talk and the way we show up to these conversations. So what does that then mean for our approach? How could that change our approach? Or even more specifically, how might conversations that happen for the benefit of the person change our approach? And when we start to think of the people that we're having these conversations with as wholly loved by God, what does that mean for our conversations? So we're going to give you a framework and that we're going to help you think through this evening. And we're going to be starting off with the before, during, after, and then the and then of how to have a difficult conversation. And this is how we are proposing to have a difficult conversation if you want that conversation to be for the benefit of the person as well as solving the problem. And when we reframe it in our minds like that, actually having a difficult conversation with somebody becomes something that is a loving gesture towards them that can help them move forward in whatever way it is, as well as just solving a problem. So we're gonna be putting these into practice in some forthcoming breakout rooms for now, but before we're just gonna talk through the before. So yeah, let's begin there. And I'm leaving these red arrows up on the screen just as a visual reminder to all of us that we're operating in that person and problem area of the graph. Um, so just hold on to that as we go through and remember that uh, these aren't just techniques. These are, these are ways to bless people as we have difficult conversations. And uh, in that vein, I think it's important to realize if you possibly can, before you have a moment to go into that uh, difficult conversation is to get praying because I know when I pray it gives me a moment to catch a breath take my blinkers off and remember that the person that I need to have this difficult conversation with is someone loved by God and God has their best interests at heart as per those principles in Matthew 18 and Getting into prayer just helps me clear my brain of all the other clutter, all the other angst that I'm normally carrying around by midday on any given day and just focus in on what the real issue is. So that's why it's important to start with prayer if you possibly can. And probably even if you have chance to do none of these other aspects, prayer is a good one to remember. But what else might we do? Well, we found it a really good strategy to uh, set a good time and place that suits the other person before you have the difficult conversation. So don't just jump 
on them uh, first thing in the morning before they've even really shown up or had their morning coffee or perhaps not the last thing in the day when everyone's a bit tired and a bit wrung out and a bit zoom fatigued if you're doing this in a physical space which is obviously the ideal then try and choose somewhere neutral not inviting them to your office not going to their office but perhaps just a neutral space uh, an empty table somewhere i know beth uh, frequents the student bar on campus to have her most difficult conversations which is a nice a nice place to be next it's important to be as crystal clear on the issue as you possibly can be so let me give you a hypothetical example um, imagine someone is showing up late consistently to your morning team meetings um, to show up to the conversation by thinking this person is always late is not entirely true it's better to be specific the thing that you want to deal with here is the fact that they have been showing up late to the weekly team meetings it helps you just drill down into the specifics and from that you can get into an example that you might want to present to the person when you show up with them so you might say at each of our weekly team meetings over the past month i've noticed you've been the last to arrive and it's meant that we're finishing our meetings at 9 20 rather than 9 15. Very specific, very detailed example. And lastly, before you show up, you might want to think about the desired outcomes of the conversation. What would make this a good conversation that benefits the person you're talking to? So again, in our hypothetical example, you probably want to instill a sense of how important these morning meetings are, how they help the team function together and set the agenda for the day. You might want to ensure their commitment to showing up on time. And you might want to offer anything that could help them. You might want to just find out what's going on with them, what's causing them to show up late to this meeting. That's a good way, again, to remember the person as well as the problem. So that's before. How about during the conversation? OK, so now you actually need to show up for the meeting. And I think a really important aspect to outline here is that what you bring to the meeting, what I bring to the meeting space, how we turn up to that conversation is really important. Because going into a difficult conversation, if you're riled up or you're strongly emotional or you're running late yourself, can get you off to a bad start. So make sure that you've taken time before to pray through the, meet the meeting. And like Tim's already said, pray for the person, give to God the time, your leadership, your influence and the potential outcome of the meeting. So once you've thought through all of that, you've taken responsibility for how you're going to turn up, it's go time. So what should you actually be doing during the conversation? Well, first of all, I want to just suggest that you have a strong opener. OK, so state why you've called the meeting. So just going um, riffing off what Tim just said, you might say, I've asked to meet with you to discuss our weekly team meetings. So have a strong opener, state why you've called the meeting. Secondly, then outline the issue. So I've noticed that you've been showing up late to our weekly team meetings over the past month. And that as a result of this, our meeting has been running over by five minutes. Then state the desired outcome. I'd like to discuss this with you, understand a bit better what's going on and agree together on any help I can give or any support that you might need to help get you to the meeting on time. Next, ask open questions, okay? So you want questions that are going to give you insight. Closed questions, questions that only require a one word answer may not get you to where you want to be in the conversation. And going back to that example, the question, were you the last person to arrive to the team meeting, might only elicit a response of yes, and straight away it's putting them on the defensive. So a better question to ask here might be, is there anything going on that is stopping you from being able to get to the meeting on time? And a question like that opens up the conversation. It allows the person to answer in their own way. Next is listen. OK, now this might seem really obvious, but in these types of conversations, it is good to be listening in order to understand rather than listening in order to respond. So have you understood what they're saying? Have you given them enough time to process the conversation? And I particularly found this in conversations that we're having around furlough um, or pay reviews or things that are happening um, in the organisation, particularly recently, we've been doing a lot of redundancy conversations giving the pauses and the silences are really important. 
don't feel like you have to fill all of the silences. Give permission for the other person to think before responding. Next is think about the type of language that you're using. So for me, this is used I'd like, not you are, because the way that we frame what we're saying is really important. So for example, um, saying I'd like to get to a point where everyone's arriving to our team meetings on time frames a positive outcome rather than you're holding up everybody by arriving late, which obviously emphasizes the negative and it apportions blame. Think about your language. I'd like this to be the outcome or I'd like us to discuss this not you are this or you are that. And remember your body language. Make sure that you keep an open body language as you go through the conversation. Now that might seem common sense, but I've been in so many mediated conversations where I've been called in as a mediator, where managers have shut off their team members by their body language without even realizing it. They're rolling their eyes, they're huffing, they're sighing, they're crossing their arms. You know, think about being present in the room or even specifically on teams virtually if you have to be. What are you saying with your body? that you're not saying with your words, are the two matching up in terms of what you're doing? And also notice your own physiological reactions. So usually when we go into a difficult meeting, that is very likely we're gonna have a lot of adrenaline that's coursing through our bodies and our levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone are higher. It's that fight or flight situation. You know, your heart starts going when you're gonna to have to say something. That's a natural reaction to a difficult conversation. And it will help you if you can learn to regulate yourself, okay? Breathe deeply, slow down your heart rate, be present in the moment. And what I often see is that people tend to speak faster when they're in that heightened state, when they're in that moment. And it's really important that you purposefully slow yourself down, even though that's gonna feel opposite to what your body is trying to tell you to do. Slow yourself down, notice your physiological reactions. And then watch the emotional barometer of yourself and the person that you're talking to. So whilst we can control, I can control what I bring to a meeting, you can control what you bring to the meeting, we can prepare well. What we can't control is the person's response to us. So you might need to have a break in the middle of the conversation in order for people to calm themselves down, to compose themselves, and that is absolutely fine. And sometimes it's useful to have a few sentences up your sleeves for moments like this. So one thing that I would say is make sure that you are constantly checking your understanding. So using a sentence like I'm hearing you say and then reflect back to them what they've said. Have I got that right? Make sure that you're checking as you go through that there's a shared language, there's a shared understanding there. Maybe give permission for people to be silent where needed. So just saying something like, would you like to take a few moments to process what I'm saying? And then if you can see that someone's in distress, give them the opportunity to pause, okay? Something like, I can see this is getting uncomfortable for you. Would you like to take a break? And it might even be that the person needs to stop and you have to rearrange another time to continue the meeting. This is lots that we're throwing at you, I know. And one of the things that I like to do when I'm going into a difficult conversation um, is that I might have a notebook with me and on one of the sides of the notebook, I'll have written out these prompts to myself, slow down, have a strong opener. I might have prepared some open questions that I know going into that, I want to ask the person. So that if I'm getting stuck in terms of what I'm doing in the moment, I can just look over and ask one of those pre-prepared questions to carry on the meeting. And for those of us who are going into any sort of processes around HR things, um, especially around things like furlough or things like pay reviews or even redundancy processes, making sure that during the meeting we've got the agenda, we know exactly what we're saying, that we've got any letters that are going to be sent out afterwards and that we know exactly what the process is in terms of making that fair and equitable for the person that you're talking to. So there's lots to remember there, um, but good, a good tactic that I found is to take a notebook with you and don't be afraid to have that with you in the meeting to be checking in on what you're doing. Hi everyone, thanks, thanks for coming back and good to be with you. Um, just to let you know that on the night when we recorded this, we accidentally forgot to record this following section. So you might be wondering why I have slightly different hair and a slightly different jumper. But just to let you know, um, we're re-recording this because we really think it's important. We wanna be able to get it out to you. So this is the section that has after and then the and then. So then we get to the after. And this isn't after 
the actual conversation. It's just the after the bulk of the conversation when you're bringing it into land at the end. First thing to do is to summarise what's been said. So you might say, I've done my best to explain the situation and what I think we can do about it. I've heard you say that you agree that this is fixable. So just a quick summary so that everyone knows what's been said. And then you can recap the next steps. So you might say, here's what we've decided to do. You'll resolve to buy your morning coffee after the meeting rather than immediately before it. You might like to confirm the time frame of what's going to happen next. For example, beginning next Monday, we're going to get this back on track with the meeting starting on time. Sometimes it can also be helpful to signpost the person if you've discovered something about them uh, where they might need further help. So again, remembering the person and the conversation being for the benefit of the person, you might think uh, along the lines of your organisation having some sort of employee assistance programme or internal mental health first aiders that you can direct the person to. It just may be helpful for you to signpost this person to other areas in your organisation where they can access support. It's good practice to let the other person have the last word. So you can just say anything else, let them fill the space. It honors them. It just lets them end the conversation on their terms. And then you can just close up by saying, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being with me in this difficult conversation. And then what happens after the after part of the conversation? So the process doesn't finish once you've had the conversation. Make sure that you take time for yourself away from distractions. Spend some time with God looking back over the conversation. It's a good opportunity for you to ask yourself to think about your personal and professional development around what did I learn? What did I do well? What could I improve next time? Did I reach the outcome that I was looking for? And if I didn't, why didn't I? And remembering to spend some time in prayer, spend time reflecting, asking, thanking, praying over next steps, whatever it is that you need to spend time with God doing. And make sure that you send a follow up email to recap and confirm the next steps. So make sure that there's a written record of what you have discussed and what you have agreed as next steps and the time frames that you are going to complete those actions in. Thanks, Beth. So there you have it. The before the during, the after, and the and then. We wanna hand it back to you guys now for this last section and think about what this could look like in reality. So we're gonna use Beth's opening story as a case study. You can find that at the top of your handout. So um, have a look at that in your breakout groups and work through it together. Think about what you would do in each stage of this difficult conversation, the before, the during and the after, according to some of the advice that Beth and I have shared with you just now. We'll give you 15 minutes to do that. Please feel free to send in your responses to Mentimeter and we'll come back for some Q&A after the break. There we are. Uh, welcome back. I hope that was helpful and just sort of brought some of this content to life a little bit. Um, I always find that working with case studies makes things uh, very real and helps me actually think through how I might apply it. So thank you for sending in some thoughts. We've got some really good uh, comments coming in on the Mentimeter. I'll just bring that up and we can go through some of what you guys think the best course of action was. And then uh, in a moment, I'll ask Beth what she actually did as well. Um, I think this person has put their finger on something. Uh, Kyle feels it has blown up beyond what he was expecting, so deal with that during the conversation. I often feel like a lot of difficult conversations arise because of differing expectations that haven't been voiced in the first place. Give me a chance to air that, speak out um, what people are assuming that hasn't been said out loud is very, very helpful. So. Um, yeah, dealing with Kyle's expectations and then what his expectations are over what should happen next, I think would be a very wise move. Beth, uh, any of these uh, jump out at you as particularly good approaches? Yeah, all of these are brilliant and thank you so much everybody. Um, I really appreciate that give them space to grieve and, re and release their emotions and find out if an apology is necessary. It's so true. And ha just having that humility to having that as an outcome, which, which might be needed. Um, and I did actually have to email Kyle a few days after to apologise myself for something I'd put in an email that actually I had misunderstood what they were saying. So, yeah, mm -hmm. always be willing and, and, you know, be the first to apologise when needed. And yeah, I think that's great. One. 
yeah um uh, i like this one in the top left respond to the email creating acknowledgement that they're hurting and some time to hear them um, and obviously you don't only need to do that in an email you can do that when you actually meet the person as well when you meet with kyle something i've been reflecting on recently is how valuable it is to just listen to people in a way that validates their story as human beings we're all crying out for validation am i heard do i matter am i important to you in this organization as christians we have an infinite resource for that when we turn to god who says yes of course you matter i love you and for us to somehow be able to model that to the people around us by just showing up and hearing their side of things hearing the hurt that they're experiencing I think communicates a tremendous amount. So I really like that comment, thanks. And then also probably here, this is good as well, accepting that one conversation can't necessarily resolve the issue in one go. So setting appropriate expectations about what the next steps are and then signposting the next steps further down the line, I think is really helpful. And it also takes the pressure off you, the conversation host, to fix everything in the there and then. So that's a good one for me. Beth, one or two more from you that stand out here? Yeah, I also just really appreciated that one. I need to take that for my own self, I think, as well. Um, I think one of the things, just looking through all of these, is that I wish that all of you on this call were managers in my organisation, because if we were actually doing this, what you're putting in, it would really go a long way for helping a lot of the difficult conversations that we're having. Mm -hmm. um, let me just, yeah, again, lots of things around acknowledging. Acknowledgement is such a huge part of it, and just being able to say, you know, this is, this is the reality of the situation. Tim is um, really ripping it out of me recently for saying that a lot of the time. But one of my things about being a leader in my organization and particularly in my position is to define reality. So understanding what is the reality, what is their reality and then managing those expectations. So yeah, some really brilliant answers. Thank you so much, everyone. One more on this, I just quickly like, Kyle thinks there are some simple steps So ask what these are or ask what these are and let him be heard. Go back mm -hmm. over these in the conversation. Um, and then apologize where appropriate. But I think the thing that struck me here is um, if the person has some ideas of what the solutions are, all the better. You, again, you don't have to fix everything. There's a good Jesuit saying that I come back to a lot, which is um, uh, the good news is that there is a Messiah and the better news is it's not you. So it's not actually on me to fix everyone's problems for them. Um, I, I'm in community with other people. I'm, I, I'm not the savior of the world and actually giving other people space to contribute. Um, is hugely important in that as well. Okay, great. Well, um, Beth, I wonder if you could share with us what you actually did and uh, what happened as a result in this situation. Yeah, I'd be delighted. And just to, just a footnote to this, to say that this isn't necessarily uh, the one and only way that I could have handled this, but this was a way that I handled it. So thankfully, um, it was actually not in full on lockdown when this happened to me a few weeks ago. So I actually arranged to meet face to face with, um, obviously they're not really called Kyle, but I arranged to meet face to face with Kyle. Uh, before I prayed a lot, I prepared for the meeting well, exactly what you were suggesting. Um, I actually created a written summary of the situation as I understood it. So I could almost read that out in terms of using some of his words from the email that he had sent me adding in pauses to check for understanding, making sure that I had those prompts for myself and then being willing to make amendments to it as I went along. I prepared a series of open-ended prompt questions that I could use with Kyle to try and go a bit deeper than just what he was presenting in terms of the issues and anger, but what could I actually ask to get behind some of that? During the meeting, I also prayed a lot. In the back of my mind was, God, you have to help me. You have to help me. What do I say next? What did I do? And um, I gave a clear agenda for the meeting. So I signposted where we were headed, what we were going to do. I booked out my calendar for as long as needed so that he knew I wasn't rushing off to another meeting. I used my summary to check for a shared understanding of the situation between us. Talk slowly, allowed him to add in, clarified or explained things that I hadn't got right apologized where needed and a lot of you picked up that he was very angry that he felt like he had got into a situation and that actually there was a box box ticking exercise and apologized for that and and our role as an organization and um, in where he had got to and then using as i said open-ended questions to delve deeper into what was going on backstage for him a lot of you picked up on this so just letting him talk you know, using active listening prompts where needed. And a big part of our conversation was actually shifting into the so what 
part of the conversation where we discussed what would happen and what we could do next that would make things better for worker him and a lot of you had picked out in the email that he already had some ideas of what that could practically look like so it was really good um to, to hear that from him and to actually agree together what we could do and then thanked him for his time affirmed him in the work that he was doing and then afterwards I prayed a lot more. <laughs> I wrote him an email, again, just summarizing our discussion, outlining clearly the next three steps we were going to take to improve his situation. There were three that we came to in the end. Um, and then I invited him to get in touch with me to check in if he needed to at any point. So that's Kyle's story. Uh, I'm sure that you all have plenty of these as well. And we're gonna tr make, try and make some time for some questions and answers surely. But before we go into that, um, I'm going to hand over to Steve for some notices. Thank you very much, uh, Beth. But before I do my notices, um, somebody still wants to hear the end of the story, Beth. Um, somebody's asked, uh, and did Kyle leave? Um, so could you respond to that? Yeah, of course. Um, Kyle hasn't left. Um, Kyle's actually on furlough at this point in time. So the story is still ongoing. Um, the grievance procedure has come to an end. Um, I won't talk too much about that and just in terms of confidentiality, but there is a clear plan of action that I'm going to be involved in as head of HR um, for the manager um, and also for Kyle and for their working relationships together. And I'm confident and hopeful that we're going to come to a good end. But yeah, it's furlough at this point in time. Beth, you can get 62 people praying for Kyle. Please, the back of oh, this event. please all pray. So, yes, that would be happens. so great. <laughs> Thank you. That'd be great. That's a good prompt to uh, pray. Well, listen, um, I've just been having a quick look at the questions and uh, decided that rather than announcing things at this stage, if it's all right, Tim, why don't we save that till later? Can we dive into the sure. questions if you guys are up for it? Yeah, of course. Um, and thanks very much, not only for putting your questions on Mentimeter, but for voting uh, things up. So I'm just going to be very democratic here and follow your votes. But there's some brilliant questions here. So we'll uh, keep them coming if there are any others. But uh, there, are, there are a few that I want to pose to the two of you. So the first and most popular one um, is um, how best to approach a conversation where you and the other party or parties have wildly different, differing or even completely opposing goals and expectations, um, either Beth or Tim, how, how do you do that? Um, oh, this is such a good question. <laughs> I'll throw in something perhaps a bit theological and then Beth, you can, cut, you can come in with the with the impactful stuff, because you, I feel like you have to live this. So here's I my theological I can also do reflection. theological, just throwing it out there. Yeah. But, you know. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, so I think, um, obviously, in a workplace context, it's it's every, every situation is unique, and um, you need to know what you are prepared to hold on to and what you're prepared to negotiate with. But underneath that is a bit of a fear, perhaps, of compromise. And actually, as Christians, I don't think we need to fear compromise. Um, there are actually biblical precedents for compromise. And I know it sounds a bit like a, a dirty word when we're told to be in the world and not of the world. But think of someone like Daniel, a civil servant um, in an organisation that uh, certainly didn't share his religious mm. outlook. Daniel made some choices about what he was prepared to hold on to and what he was prepared to give up. Um, and you can read about that in Daniel chapter one. But I just offer that as an example of where a sort of faithful, thoughtful, prayerful compromising on what values were important, and what he was prepared to give some ground on uh, actually played out. And, and I think that can be helpful to have in mind. Actually, God's big enough to, to handle that and to hold on to that. And as we're thinking about the person as well as solving the problem, that's a, that's a useful thing to have in mind. But Beth, what do you think, practically speaking? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I would say is depending on what the situation is, um, first of all, decide if you want to go there. Don't feel like you have to go there or that that's something that you really need to do. Um, if you do want to go there, then exactly what, what Tim has said um, in terms of compromising, but also don't automatically assume bad intent. And I think that's something to just keep in the back of your mind when, when entering into a conversation like this. Um, ask questions. Again, just what we said, stay calm. Um, know what you want to say and boil it down to a, to a few points um, if there's a situation where you have the opportunity to really think about what you're saying before you get into it. I think one of the, one of the important things is ask if you can ask about what they think. So um, if there's a, a situation where you're really disagreeing with somebody or there's a point of view that you, you disagree with strongly or, or maybe you don't even really understand, 
just have that shared expectation of can I ask you about this I'm going to be asking some questions I'm not necessarily meaning to come across in a way that is adversarial but I want to understand better so help me and um, try and avoid the using the word but <laughs> in a conversation like this that can be really useful and um, in in drama games we think of an and instead of a but so when you're um, having that engagement with somebody and they're saying something think yes and I also think this and and rather than yes but I think this which comes across as quite adversarial and tell stories I think is is useful in this kind of situation if you can talk about your own experience and you can humanize it in that kind of sense then that can go a long way to really helping bridge some of the gaps in a conversation like this and then lastly I think I would say don't be afraid to get someone else involved if you need to have a mediated conversation and there is a situation in your workplace that is untenable and you've done everything that you can do and there's just no way of moving forward don't be afraid to speak to um, you know a third party or HR their line manager you know somebody trusted within the organization to say actually we really need some help to talk about this and having a facilitator in the room with you can be really helpful. Fantastic. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Tim. That's that's really helpful. A couple of questions coming up really about this whole issue of power imbalances when um, you know, you're just conscious of that going into a conversation. So uh, an, a, a really, an example has been given in the question, what tips would you give for having a difficult conversation when the person who's called the meeting is more senior to you, um, and I love this bit, and isn't handling the conversation well or with emotional intelligence. Can I just say that the questioner clearly has hyper emotional <laughs> intelligence, so well done for that. But seriously, how would you handle that conversation, guys? Uh, let me just jump in and say something about power that I, that I think is <laughs> worth reflecting on. Um, uh, power isn't always distributed in the same way that organisational authority is distributed. And in the Emerging Leaders Programme, a, a conviction that we build a lot of the content on is that actually you have power, you always have power to take the lead and influence any situation for the better and for kingdom impact. And power isn't, it also isn't a zero sum game. We, it's not like if they've got all the power, I have none, or that they just, they, somehow they hold all the cards. I don't think that's ever the case. Power is something that we're sometimes afraid of and used badly power power can make things worse but i think really um when you think about the most powerful person in the universe i.e jesus he had power and he used it for blessing and to bring about flourishing in others and power combined with love i think is actually um a really redemptive way to think about the kind of choices that we can make. So again, just trying to get behind some of the assumptions of the question that might be about feeling disempowered. I think actually um, we can claim that power is something God has given all of us and it, we have an ability to affect change in any situation that we're in. So again, that's a bit of a theological perspective. Um, Beth, I know you have to deal with this on a regular basis. So what about the practicalities? Yeah, and just to say to whoever asked this question, you're not alone uh, in this feeling or, or in this experience. Um, I, I think, first of all, it's really good at what Tim was saying in terms of true power creating flourishing. And don't be afraid to take the lead or to step up and take the lead in a, in a respectful way in this sort of situation. A, a lot of the things that we hear now in organisational speak is managing upwards, which I love that, the idea of that. Um, and I think one of the first things is for you to find a safe space to vent your frustrations. Because if, if what I'm understanding in the words behind this question is that um, my manager or my leader isn't doing what I think they should do or isn't acting in a way that I think that they should do or I expect that they should do. Um, it would be really good for you to have somewhere to actually process some of that, whether that be within the organization or external to the organization, but just make sure that you have a space to really think through um, why is it frustrating? What ways is it that it's frustrating? What, um, how is it that they're acting or that they're not saying things or that they're emotionally unintelligent? And are there other people that need to know about this actually? And then just some really quick um, kind of practical things. 
using language like it would really help me if you would dot 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 so you know if you're in the meeting with them and and something's happening and you're thinking oh my goodness this is really frustrating to me we're not getting to a point for example being able to say it would really help me actually if you could just outline for me where is it that you're wanting to get to by the end of this conversation that would really help me understand what we're trying to achieve here and um, yeah clarify their expectations can can i just ask what are you wanting from me in this meeting or can i just ask where are you hoping to get to or what is it that we can do together asking those sorts of clarifying questions and um, don't be afraid to share your feelings and this is something that we see a lot in terms of our um performance management in, in particular and um, you know saying things like actually when you say xyz it makes me feel abc can i just check is that what you were meaning to say is that what you were meaning to, to to get across to me or have i misunderstood that and being able to really clarify that and say ouch that actually really hurt and the way that you put that across was actually quite offensive to me can i just check were you meaning that or or actually was it something else that you meant to say um, and then ask for time to process if you need it if you're in the middle of, of a meeting and they've just said something that's really hurtful or their emotional intelligence is just not there at all to say actually can i just have a few minutes and um, i just need to process some of this or would it be okay for me just to to nip to the toilet um, and come back in a moment or um if you're on zoom don't do this but you could just be like oh well my computer's packed up and then just leave the call <laughs> probably don't do that last one <laughs> Thanks very much, Beth. I'm sure we've all been tempted to do yeah, that one. So many times. No, that, that's really helpful. <laughs> Listen, these are great questions, guys, and, and do keep them coming. Um, the next uh, most popular one, uh, but a, a really important one, um, reads thus. The human grieving processes when faced with redundancies um, are often not in sync with the time that's given in the consultation process. So how best can we deal with strong and unresolved emotions? Yeah, thank you so much for this question. Uh, I'm just going to jump in and answer this one and Tim, you can add anything that you want um, to the end of it. So in our organisation, my team and I have just um, undertaken over 120 individual consultation meetings. And I've been involved in our employee representative forum and collective consultation on behalf of our employees as well between um, the employees and, and us as the management. Um, this is such a good question and also such a complex um, there's so many facets to it and I think actually it's different for the people who are staying as a result of it the people who are survivors as, as we would um, call them in terms of organizational speak and for those who are leaving and um, there will be different a whole raft of different emotions to, to be facing on on both sides of those um, I'd be really in, I'm just going to talk a bit, but if please do ask a follow up question if I'm not hitting what, what you are wanting to know particularly because I don't know if you're the teller in this situation or if you are the person who is hearing this or if you're just in the organization. Um, but I think, first of all, people need to feel heard and giving them that opportunity to talk and listen. And that is can be very, very draining on you if you are the receiving the receiver of that. So what I would say is um, if that is you, please find support for yourself in the midst of that, because having gone through all the meetings that I've just had, it was so important that I had a support network outside of my everyday work that would actually help me bounce back and be able to turn on the computer for the next ones as well. Um, I think the change curve is, is quite useful here, uh, the Kubler-Ross change curve. If you haven't come across that, then I would, I would um, really encourage you to go, through, to go through some of that. But actually the main thing about it is that, um, so it's a curve, um, it was originally used for um, people who were going through a grieving process. Um, and it starts off uh, kind of with, you know, uh, denial and then anger and bargaining, and then ultimately into acceptance. And the idea is that you can be anywhere in that curve um, as you're going through that change and you can move forward and backwards. And um, we talk about this in our organization called the messy middle. So you know where you're coming from, you have an idea of where you're ending up, but the messy middle is just ongoing and ongoing. Um, and you can be at any point in that throughout the whole process. And, and I think sitting with them in that is a really important part of what it is to enable people to grieve. And I would also say find other support for them. So we mentioned it earlier, but it might be things like um, going to mental health first aiders or an employee assurance program. Um, your HR team will know about different places that they can signpost. 
Um, Minds is a great charity, um, again, to signpost people to. Uh, there's lots of, um, in, in Nottingham, we have Trent Talking, um, which is a, a really brilliant charity that works with people in terms of mental health uh, and well-being. So look at, at what, what other charities are there in your local place that you can signpost them to. Obviously, their GP is something um, that you can appoint them to. The National Career Service, for anybody who isn't aware of this, offer an amazing wraparound package for anybody who's facing redundancy. And you can sign up to that. It's completely free. They'll run um, workshops for you. They'll run individual meetings. And actually, even if a person is made redundant, they carry that on for 12 months and they can help them write CVs and interviews and, and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, don't take feelings personally. I know it's hard, but when people are just going at you and they are you know, really letting you have both barrels, um, it's at you, but it's not at you. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and then try and find some constructive outlets for their emotions. So it might be that there's a representative forum that they might want to, to bring it into, or you might have a feedback loop into senior managers where they can actually sit down and, and write some of this in. So find constructive ways for them to turn their emotions into actual practical things that are going to be moving forward. Uh, thanks very much for that. That's really helpful and really appreciate um, all of the uh, chat that I've seen around that in the in the sort of chat function, but also some of the resources that you've mentioned and I know Tim has added to the chat and I think a couple of uh, uh, participants have too. Thanks so much. I'm going to press on because there's su such good questions here and we want to get as many in as possible. Um, Beth, you mentioned in what you just mentioned there about seeking obviously sort of to understand and seeking some middle ground. So the next question is a good follow on. Any advice when there isn't a middle ground outcome? Mm. By the way, you're very welcome to move to number 10 and to Brussels after this question. Any advice <laughs> when there isn't middle ground outcome and you can't find agreement and neither can you give that final bit of ground? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, a really good question here. If you've done everything that you can do and you've tried everything that you can, you've written the email to say we had this conversation, but we couldn't agree. You know, you, you've, you've done everything. It's time to get somebody else involved. And this this could be um, their line manager. Again, it depends on what the situation is. Um, if it's I'm, I'm just assuming here that it's a work situation and that um, you're going to need to work together in the future. And um, so it would be worth thinking about either contacting their line manager or contacting a trusted other manager within the organization um, and and really handing over the process to somebody else. And, and I think this kind of comes back to, um, you know, what we were talking about earlier in terms of don't be afraid to ask for help if you've done everything that you can you've acted with integrity you've done all of the things that we've listed and um, you're really at a loss then it's time to to probably get somebody else involved and maybe have a mediated conversation or or, or find a way to agree to disagree civilly and still work together Thank you again for that. Listen, a heartfelt question to follow on. Um, somebody's written, thank you very much for acknowledging the physiology side of things. What would you be your advice if I'm not easily able to regulate myself? Is there anything beyond good preparation, obviously, and breathing that might help? Yeah, I can jump in on that. Um, I think there are a few other things that you can do here, as well as uh, praying, which I'm sure you would be doing anyway. Um, the, the main kind of strategy for self-management and self-leadership in a situation like this is to give yourself time to breathe. Um, you don't have to come up with everything on the fly and be an expert and come up with the right answers first time. So Beth mentioned having a notebook and pen to hand. I think that can be an actual, a really good uh, device, a tool for you to use just to take stock and write some things down. It's a bit less awkward than just sitting there not knowing what to say. Even if you write down I do not know what I am doing right now. It just creates some space in the conversation to reflect for the other person to process um, and for you to get your thoughts together. If you're anything like me, um, I, uh, I, uh, my writing is a lot slower than my thinking. So it actually forces me to slow down when I'm concentrating on the words that are on the page. You can go and get a drink. You can go and use the toilet. You can even say, hey, I just want to call a few minutes time out, I just need to go outside, clear my head, get some fresh air. All of that is more than valid. Um, and again, it just helps deconstruct that messiah complex that we think we might need to have when we show up to these difficult conversations. That's great, no, thank you very much. Just a, a quick question in here, but again, really important one. Somebody's written, I imagine it's good to be careful in promising things, e.g. Mm -hmm. confidentiality, for example, where there may be a safeguarding issue. Any, yep. any comments from either of you on, on that? 
yeah, in my experience, you, um, I don't think confidentiality is ever something you can promise outright. Um, you, but you can explain the situation and say, I will, I will hold this in confidence, but if, if we get to a point where I need to pass this up to someone in higher authority, I will need to do that. And uh, you don't need to apologize for that. That's totally legitimate to do in my experience. Beth, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to really underline what you just said, and don't be afraid. Um, so if you ever get the the washing machine feeling where somebody said something and you're like, oh dear, here we go. Um, don't ever be afraid to say, okay, I'm just going to stop you there. I need to let you know that anything that you're about to say to me, um, if I need to, I will pass it on to other people. And and it's different um, when it comes to safeguarding, um, ch children and adults are different in terms of, of that sort of thing and how you would um, go forward with that. But one thing that I would say is that when it comes to adults and safeguarding, it's really important that they are included in the actions of what's going to happen next to them. So I would definitely just spend more time on um, the, the kind of this is what we're going to do next. You know, I'm going to go and speak to um, whatever appropriate party. It might be HR and um, safeguarding advisor and, um, you know, you know, line manager and um, the appropriate person and say, then this is what I'm going to do. I am going to do it face to face or I'm going to do it via email. I'm going to do it before tomorrow, before the end of the week. Um, after that, we will hear back and we will move forward by doing A, B, C. You know, just make it really clear to them what the expectations are. Um, but yeah, I think when it when it comes to safeguarding, um, it's absolutely number one thing to do is um, refer it. Even, even if it's something that you think, oh, I'm not really sure if this is a safeguarding issue or where it is. If it's put red, red lights on your dashboard, it might be nothing. It might be something. So make sure that you refer it to the appropriate person. No, that's really helpful. Uh, that, that principle of always refer. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Just in terms of uh, relationships, um, how do you deal with dual relationships? Somebody put here, i.e. if you work with someone and you also go to the same church. So you've got sort of, you know, different aspects to your relationship. Any any thoughts on that? Another issue that um, comes up as a, a recurring difficulty for workplace leaders, especially first time workplace leaders, is around boundaries. And uh, I was speaking with someone uh, a little more experienced about this today as well. So <laughs> um, I think having boundaries about what's appropriate inside work and outside of work is really important here to um, remember that the person is a whole person in the sense that actually um, you might have some more information on uh, who they are and what they're carrying than any of your colleagues and, and to um, bring that into the conversation accordingly and appropriately is fine but also to I think probably explicitly state with that person what we're talking about here is a work situation and I need to remind you I love you you're a brother or sister in my church and this isn't going to affect our personal relationship outside of this working relationship um and what was I just going to say I've forgotten Beth I'll pass to you and then it'll come back to me ah, yeah I was just going to add to that to say one of the biggest things is managing expectations don't be afraid to have that conversation to say, you know, this is a bit awkward, isn't it, in terms of we work together, but we're also a church together. And then you both have agency in terms of what you're bringing in here. So, you know, I would like us to work like this together. What do you think about that? Um, in terms of church, you know, I'm happy to be praying for you on Sunday and then line managing you on Monday. How does that make you feel? And just just have that conversation and don't be afraid to go there together because share, getting that out in the open, sharing those expectations, having a shared understanding and a shared accountability is, is going to be really important in that. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Somebody's just put in, and I'm keen, keen to squeeze in a couple more questions before we uh, need to sort of close. My difficult conversations often come out of the blue where there's no time to have um, things planned. Any top tips? I guess attending tonight is one, so tick for that, <laughs> but anything else? I would say you don't have to have the conversation immediately, basically. Again, you can buy yourself more time than you probably think you can. And um, I know, as an introverted processor, I'm at my best when I've had time to go away, think about what I want to say, what the other person is bringing to the conversation, and then come back to them. I don't think there's, if you can do this, anything wrong inherently with saying, thank you so much. I've heard what you've said. I want to talk to you about this. Can I come back to you this afternoon, tomorrow, and we can deal with it properly when I'm in a better headspace to do so? No, great. 
and uh, sorry, if oh, I can sorry. Yeah, quick, please yeah, can do. Add yeah, sorry, Beth. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah so I think something that's really important there is what's the state of emergency? Okay, so if somebody's coming to you with a difficult conversation and you can't put it off, and it is an emergency, it needs to happen right there, right now. And um, there's a three R's framework that I would suggest you use. So first is realize. Can you realize what's actually happening in the situation? So ask for clarifying questions. Get to the bottom of it. Second is react which will both be in your own physiology, in yourself, and then also how you are reacting to the person. And that can be a, um, you know, anything just as checking in with yourself to be like, okay, we're going into flight mode, that kind of thing, and just calm yourself down. Um, and then reacting professionally to them, you know, and just making sure that you're calm. And then third is redeem. What can you do to redeem the situation? Right there, right then, what's the next steps that need to happen? So realize, react, redeem. Great, no, thank you very much indeed. Um, one probably final question, which I think cuts the heart of a number of things we've talked about. Um, what tools or strategies can help when the difficult conversation is with someone who actually does want to criticize you personally? That feels very different to the scenario where the anger was at a third party. So what when things become personal? Yeah, I had a meeting with someone um, while we were going through our, our uh, redundancy consultation um, who said, Beth, you're a monster. I don't know how you sleep at night. Um, I blame you for everything that's going on and it's your fault that we're in this. And, and I just, it, I really wasn't expecting it. It completely came out of the blue and it hit me right in the feels. And I just thought, oh, you have no idea how many countless sleepless nights I've had over there. And you know, I wanted to just go off on one. Um, but I, I think one of the main things to do was um, to try and get over the shock. <laughs> so again, breathing, realizing, um, thankfully I had a pen and paper there. So I was able to just you know, write down um, for myself, okay, I'm, I'm feeling a bit <laughs> um, out of it at the moment. And then being able to just um, say to them, okay, um, you know, I hear what you're saying. Could you help me understand that a bit more? Tell me about how you're feeling. Tell me about what it is that I've done that has made you feel that way. And can you just help me understand a bit better? And then after that, it's going away from that meeting and um, working out what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. And this is something that um, I do a lot with my um, accountability prayer partners, our network group, you know, people, trusted people where it's appropriate is going through, okay, I've had this feedback. Actually, some of this, it is appropriate for me to take on because I do, I do that a lot. Um, you know, I, I do speak over people or I, I do take control of situations when actually I shouldn't, et cetera. I'm just using my own examples here. Um, and then there's going to be things that people say that say, actually, no, I don't believe that to be true. And I haven't had that feedback from other people for, before. This isn't something that I consistently see in myself and therefore I'm going to let it go and pray, you know, thoughtfully pray through it. What do I need to change? What's legitimate? What's not legitimate? And then being able to, to, to close the feedback loop to that person to say, you know, I thank you for the, for the meeting that we had. I, you know, this is what I understood you saying in your feedback, I've taken this on board. Um, and as a result of this conversation, I'm going to be doing A, B or C differently. Or um, the, the difficult, the more difficult conversation, which is actually, um, I've heard what you've said, but I disagree with it. And I disagree with it for this, for these reasons. And actually, I would appreciate if we could have a conversation about how we might work together moving forward in a way that's going to help us um, me to have a better working relationship off the back of what you've expressed to me. So good luck. If that is you, <laughs> you need to have that conversation. Well, Beth, I just want to thank you very much and Tim for those uh, answers. It's really, really helpful. And thanks to all of you. They've been fantastic questions. There are one or two others uh, that I wasn't able to get round to, and uh, we will sort of um, post details to you in terms of what we send later. But thanks very much, both for submitting questions and for voting for them. So that's that. That's great. Well, listen, I'm keen to close. Um, and actually, I, I think it'd be good, wouldn't it, just to pause. Beth invited us to pray for Kyle, but it might be that you've got somebody else on your mind or your heart. We probably all do, actually, uh, in regard to people who we've perhaps got a difficult conversation to come up with, or we've had a difficult conversation. And maybe tonight has prompted us to think through the Lord's eyes, ah, I need to go back to that. So I just want to leave a moment of uh, quiet, and then I'll pray, and then just a few final things before we close. Let's just be quiet uh, together. Um, and let's remember before God, uh, Kyle, and let's remember before God, anyone the Lord is bringing into your mind, into your heart, maybe someone, maybe a colleague who you've spoken to um, this past week, or maybe somebody you're going to be speaking to tomorrow, 
or someone you're going to be speaking to next week. Lord God, in the stillness at the end of a busy day, in the stillness at the end of lots of questions, lots of content, lots of input, we just want to pray, Lord, for people like Kyle. We want to pray for Kyle. I want to pray, Lord, for other people that you put on our hearts. Thank you that you know them. And thank you for the encouragement we've come to this evening uh, to try and put ourselves in their shoes, uh, to be like Christ to them, to show compassion, to really listen. And thank you, Lord, for the tools and ideas that we've been provided with. Thanks, Lord, for Tim and Beth and the way they've taken us through this. And we just commit to you, Lord, the situations that you're going to bring us into uh, tomorrow, in the days that follow. Lord, we know sometimes we might feel unprepared, but we thank you that you are with us as we've learnt. And we pray that you'll help us to be the kind of people you want us to be. For we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, I just think we should do the usual thing, um, uh, which is uh, at least uh, fiddling around with Zoom to make sure that you can put a hand clap for uh, Beth and Tim. I think what they've given us has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much to the two of you. And thanks, um, Beth, for your openness and honesty uh, in regard to your situation. Let's be praying for Beth. But as we sort of said, um, we've been open and honest, but this is all confidential. Thanks, Tim, um, for also leading us in God's word and for your wisdom alongside. Really, really appreciate it. And thanks to you guys uh, for being with us for the full two hours. Really appreciate that. Have a wonderful safe night. I don't have to say travel safe. Um, well, do anyway, walking up the stairs or going and having a cup of coffee. Thanks again to you. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks, thanks. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.